Fire Emblem Radiant Dawn is a game that's pretty highly regarded by many for its cast of memorable characters, fantastic world building, and pretty unique gameplay. At various times throughout the game, you find yourself taking control of multiple different armies, with it all culminating in a direct conflict between all the warring nations. So as the game progresses, there's this distinct, fatalistic sense that the impending conflict is absolutely unavoidable, despite how little the parties involved actually want to fight each other. Some of the leaders you take control of even go so far as to claim that they're entirely dedicated to avoiding fighting at all costs, to varying degrees of success. But what if we actually tried to avoid combat at all costs? How would this change how we play the game? What new strategies would we need to come up with? Well, in this four-part series, that's exactly what I'll be trying to figure out. So join me, as I once again try to push a game to its absolute limits in my Fire Emblem Radiant Dawn Minimum Combats run. But first, let me give you a quick breakdown of how it's all going to work, starting with the rules. First and foremost, our main goal is to minimize the number of combats our units engage in to the very best of our ability. We'll define our units as those under our direct control. So to put it simply, blue units. This means that any combat seen by green other units or yellow ally units won't count. A fact that's going to be very crucial to many of our strategies. Furthermore, we aren't just counting kills, as is the case with many pacifist runs that other players have done. Instead, we'll be counting any combat that our units engage in, whether or not it actually results in anyone dying. I chose to count combats rather than just kills for a few reasons. First, as you'll soon see, minimizing combats rather than kills fundamentally changes the way we approach building our strategies. While combats and kills may superficially sound pretty similar, the minutia that separate the two objectives really can't be understated. Most notably, managing enemy ranges and unit positioning becomes far more important. If we really want to push our combats as low as they'll go, we'll have to carefully leverage all of Radiant Dawn's unique mechanics to keep both our units and the enemies away from danger. Another significant motivation for choosing combats over kills is rooted in the very nature of Radiant Dawn's design itself. Not only is it an extremely long game with a whopping 42 chapters, but a lot of them are route maps. By focusing on combats, we can make those route maps just a bit more interesting to plan out, since the number of kills required tends to be relatively fixed, but the number of combats it takes isn't. Focusing on combats also just generally makes avoiding reinforcements a bit more important, on both route and non-route maps alike. We'll also be playing on easy mode, since its blend of lower enemy density and plentiful bonus experience to make up for missed combat aligns perfectly with our goals. We also won't be giving our units any free stats by giving them transfer bonuses. This was kind of just a personal choice. While it would make hitting certain one round thresholds a bit easier, I wanted the run to be realistically doable on a fresh save file, so I ultimately just chose not to use them at all. And with that, we've covered all the major rules I gave myself for the run, although there is still one more thing I wanted to talk about really quick before we start. Now, since Radiant Dawn is such an absolutely massive game, I've chosen to break this challenge up into four separate videos, one for each of its four parts. While this does allow me to focus a lot more on the individual parts and the chapters and strategies found therein, I was still forced to cut things down a bit. But fear not, if you're interested in seeing any of the clears in their entirety, I've uploaded all of them as unlisted videos and compiled them into one big playlist, which I will have linked in the description. Anyways, with that all covered, we can finally get started with part one. I hope you enjoy. Right after starting up a new game, we're immediately introduced to the first army we'll be taking control of, the Dawn Brigade. In part one, we follow this ragtag band of freedom fighters as they rebel against the Benyon occupying force, which, as the name implies, has been occupying Dane and oppressing its people since they lost the Mad King's War. Because they're basically just a bunch of Dane citizens with no formal combat training whatsoever, 
The Dawn Brigade spends the first few chapters just trying to avoid any open confrontations with the far better equipped Banyan soldiers. And in the first of many of Radiant Dawn's fantastic examples of gameplay story integration, get ready to hear that phrase a lot, they have some quite abysmal base stats to match this reputation, which is a bit of a problem for us. You'll notice very quickly in this run that one-rounding enemies is one of the most important things that any unit can do. Every combat that a unit takes part in that doesn't result in a kill is typically pretty bad, since it means we took an additional combat that we probably didn't need to. In the early game in particular, we're also much more limited in what we can do to actually secure one-round kills, necessitating a reliance on things like rig crits and level ups, which is especially prevalent with our starting cast of scrubs. Eventually, however, once we have a bit more time to funnel some kills into our primary combat units and give them some better weapons, they'll be able to naturally hit those one round thresholds much more easily. But until then, things are just going to have to be a bit scuffed. Which finally brings us to the prologue, where we immediately have to rely on Edward critting all four enemies we're forced to fight. Thankfully, Edward doubles and naturally has about 10 crit on all the brigands, meaning that he's able to one round them all without too many resets. By taking hits on the first few bandits, he's also able to set up Wrath, a skill that boosts his crit by 50 while under 30% HP, making our crits on the last few enemies much more reliable. Unfortunately, Edward still fell short of being able to one round the boss, so we were already forced to accept an extra combat and kill him in two rounds instead, ending the map in a total of five combats. Not a great sign for things to come if we struggled this much against some random group of brigands, but who knows, maybe some way we'll find a way to add some stronger, more seasoned fighters to our ranks. Despite the pretty rough start, things only continue to get worse as we immediately run into the Benyon occupying force and are forced to face them in a head-on confrontation. Thankfully, however, Due to Edward's free levels in the prologue and his innate access to Wrath, he was all ready to start single-handedly carrying the rest of the Dawn Brigade on his back. So, unsurprisingly, Edward took care of all the combat in this map, starting by picking up a couple of one-rounds on the enemies blocking our way to the boss. Before we go any further, I think now's a good time to mention a common theme that we'll be seeing throughout Part 1, and that's easy mode sometimes having a different win condition than what you'd see on the higher difficulties. This is most prevalent in Part 1, but it'll still show up in a few key maps in Parts 2 and 3. But for now, let's just look at 1-1, where on easy mode, all we have to do is kill the boss, rather than getting Micaiah to the escape point. After clearing out the only two enemies blocking our path to the boss, Edward was pretty easily able to accomplish this by landing at least one of two Wrath crits, allowing us to clear the map in only three combats. After narrowly escaping capture, we run into Laura, a local priestess who implores us to help her reclaim some medicine that the Benyon occupying force had illegally stolen. In the face of such a great injustice, Micaiah of course obliges, and we begin preparing for another grueling encounter with Benyon forces. Continuing the trend of easy mode having different objectives, in Chapter 1-2, we're tasked with routing every enemy on the map rather than simply needing to get Laura to arrive at a seize point, like you would on normal and hard mode. Upon starting the chapter, we're immediately faced with yet another complication. All of our units are force deployed and have fixed starting positions, leaving us in a pretty precarious situation that we'd have to get creative to work our way out of. Everyone starts in a small, cramped room with enemies sitting right outside that only Edward can one round. Fortunately, I was eventually able to get around this by sending Leo and Eddie up on the ledge to the north, and then cramming Nolan, Micaiah, and Laura safely into the corner in the room below. With this positioning, Edward was able to enemy phase the nearby Myrmidon, and then immediately drop back down the ledge to one round the soldier on the next player phase, giving our units some much needed breathing room. With that taken care of, I continued to feed every kill to Eddie as we made our way through the map where we were eventually joined by Micaiah's right-hand man, Soth. Soth is, for all intents and purposes, 
effectively the Jagan of the Dawn Brigade, and as such, is already capable of one-rounding most of the enemies we'll be facing throughout the entirety of Part 1. As great as his combat is though, right now his lockpicking abilities are far more important to us. Upon reaching the boss, Soth immediately opens the nearby chest and grabs our first stat booster of the run, an energy drop. Now, knowing how amazing a free plus two strength is when it comes to securing one rounds, I decide to immediately put it to use. Since Edward's already been popping off over the last few chapters, and could really use the damage boost to help him keep up with one round thresholds, he's obviously a prime target for such investment. With this in mind, I of course immediately give it to Leonardo instead. Now, Leo contributes practically nothing to this run, with one exception. You see, there's still one enemy left besides the boss that we have yet to kill, a lone soldier standing below a ledge guarding some chests. This soldier won't move, so he can only be killed from the ledge above with a two range weapon. At this point, our only options for doing so are Micaiah and Leo, and as it stands, neither of them are capable of one rounding the soldier. Micaiah does good damage with her light magic, but she's too slow to double, and Leo doubles, but is too weak to do enough damage to kill. So we're effectively in a Goldilocks and the Three Bears type of situation, just, you know, without the good middle option. At least, that would be the case were it not for the energy drop we just picked up. With that extra plus two strength, Leo is just barely able to pick up a one round on the soldier allowing us to fully route every enemy on the map without missing a single one round, clearing the chapter in 12 combats, and firmly cementing Leonardo's status as one of Radiant Dawn's top tier combat units. Clearly. After successfully recovering the medicine, Micaiah is rewarded for her good deeds by being caught and imprisoned by Jared, the leader of the Benyon Occupying Force. This sets us up for yet another escape sequence in 1-3, although on easy mode it's once again been changed to simply be a kill boss objective instead. It's also notable for being the first map that features non-blue units that we can use to avoid combat. In this case, we're joined by two yellow ally units, meaning that we can actually give them specific commands and direct them to body block for our units. Since they're both completely unarmed here, they serve as perfect bait for the enemies, and allow us to completely avoid any extra combats, despite once again being stuck with some pretty unfortunate starting positions. In this clear, we're also able to leverage shoving, one of Radiant Dawn's unique mechanics, to let our units move through the map at a much faster pace. Most notably, we give our new Thunder Mage Ileana a couple shoves over the first two turns, that just barely allow her to reach and one round an Armor Knight on turn two. After recruiting Aaron with Laura, Edward is able to make his sole contribution to the clear by murking the other soldier reinforcement that spawned alongside him. After that, it was finally time to take on the boss, a job which Soth proved to be perfect for. With the one Armor Knight blocking our path to the boss dead, Soth quickly moved in, and in an instant, it was all over. He started by killing a Myrmidon on turn 2 enemy phase, then proceeded to steal the Discipline Scroll from the boss on the following player phase, and then immediately killed the boss with a card crit at the start of the very next enemy phase, ending the map in only 4 combats. After making yet another dashing escape, we take a little detour to go loot some treasure-filled ruins, uh, I mean, we go follow a voice that Micaiah hears calling us to a temple that just so happens to be loaded with treasure that we have no choice but to line our pockets with. I mean, if we don't take it, who else will? Well, upon entering the ruins, we immediately get an answer to that question, as we run into a couple bandits that were also there for the treasure and we're forced to once again prepare for battle. But things quickly take a turn for the worse. These were no ordinary run-of-the-mill bandits like the ones we faced in the prologue. These were Lagoo's bandits, making them much, much scarier to fight. Even on easy mode, Lagoo's tend to be some of the more difficult enemies to naturally hit one-round thresholds on. 
Thankfully, this is also the first chapter where we get access to the preps menu, which gives us access to just about everything we'd need to succeed. While Edward and Soth were already both fast enough at this point to double even the speediest cats on this map, they were still lacking the damage they needed to one round the tigers. As such, I started by immediately cooking up a huge iron sword forge for Edward, giving it as much extra might and crit as possible, and bought a beast killer for Soth, which would have an effective 27 might against any beast lagoos he may face in the future. With these powerful weapons now in hand, we were prepared for anything the bandits could throw at us. My overall strategy for the map ended up being pretty straightforward. With their shiny new toys in hand, both Soth and Edward were able to reliably one round pretty much every enemy on the map, so most of the strategy revolved around deciding how exactly I wanted to split up the kills between the two, and where I should send them to do so, with the optional chests and hidden treasure adding some slight complications. Edward took the southern half of the map, being followed closely behind by Meg and Nolan. Up north, we sent Soth, along with just about everyone else. There was a pretty scary breakable wall blocking our path to the north, however, I got super lucky on my first attempt at recording the chapter, and Leonardo was able to proc cancel on the door to avoid any possible counterattacks, allowing us to safely demolish it and begin moving forward. With the scariest threat on the map now neutralized, Soth quickly made his way over to the boss in the northwestern corner, easily one-rounding him and the lagoos he faced along the way. After killing one last lagoos on the western side, I then set up a massive shove train to get Soth all the way over to the chest on the other side of the map over the next two turns, despite all the sand that threatened to impede our movement. In the meantime, as Edward carved his way through the southern half of the map, I tried my luck at picking up the first buried treasure. Under the assumption that the buried treasure formula was the same as the GBA games, and that everyone except Soth had a roughly equal chance of picking up the treasure, I proceeded to spend about 20 minutes straight just resetting to pick up the Master Seal in the southeastern corner of the map. After several dozen resets, I started to get impatient and decided to look up the formula just to be sure, and what I found on the resulting wiki page horrifies me to this very day. To my dismay, I quickly learned that my prior assumption about finding buried treasure was completely false. Far from everyone having equal chances, the odds of any non-thief unit picking up buried treasure is entirely determined by that unit's skill stat and biorhythm. And as it turns out, Nolan was on bad biorhythm the whole time, so it took so much longer than it probably should have to get that stupid master seal. Realizing my mistake, I had Micaiah, who actually had good biorhythm, go pick up the second and last buried treasure we'd be obtaining. The Beast Foe Scroll, a skill that would allow us to give beast effectiveness to any unit we wanted. Sadly, we won't be able to use it for this map, but it'll be extremely helpful in some future clears. After that, Soth hopped off the shove train to grab the Seraph Robe from the northeastern chest, and then Edward swooped in to kill the other boss with a flashy crit from his forged iron sword, completing the map in a total of 8 combats. After clearing out all the bandits, we proceed to find even more lagoos in the heart of the ruins, except this group is much friendlier. So friendly, in fact, that one of them even agrees to join our army. Volug, a wolf, boasts both the high speed of the cats and the damage and bulk of the tigers, making him fantastic at hitting one rounds. While he may sound pretty perfect for our particular needs, in the long term, he is held back pretty significantly both by the fact that he's locked to one range, and that he has a lower EXP gain than his non lagoos counterparts. But, in the short term, his combination of high mobility and stellar combat is still going to be extremely helpful. And lucky for us, we won't have to wait very long to start seeing Volug's combat prowess in action. The Dawn Brigade, now in search of the rumored Secret Prince of Dayan, is immediately thrust back into battle as they're drawn into a commotion near the ruins. The next chapter, 1-5, is the first map that features green units, the other non-enemy army that we can get to do combat in our stead. Unlike yellow units, however, we have no way of issuing them commands directly, 
and their actions are often a lot more difficult to predict and control. Regardless, there are still usually at least some things we can do to get them to help us out. And what better way to demonstrate this than with yet another map that gets turned into a route map on easy mode, and a green army composed of three seasoned veterans capable of tearing apart the entire enemy army. Now, typically this trio of green units, composed of Jill, Zihark, and Teronio, tend to be seen as more of a hindrance than anything else. Specifically Jill, because she likes to get killed and cause a game over on the harder difficulties. But, in a run like this, they're a godsend. There is one small problem though. As I alluded to earlier, green units tend to have pretty wacky AI, and they're no exception. Likely owing to it being a defend map on the harder difficulty modes, the greeny trio here really hates fighting enemies outside the little box that they started, and will rarely move to do so. So getting them to kill everything for us was still going to be a bit tricky. Since they weren't going to move to fight the enemies, we'd need the enemies to be the ones taking the initiative instead. As such, my main strategy was to just get as far away from the enemies as possible, so their AI targeting would make them move towards the much closer green units instead. Upon starting the map, we're immediately greeted by three enemies that will always start walking towards us right from the get-go, no matter what. So much for that plan, I guess. I'm, I'm kidding. Our plan stayed the same, but we did have to immediately take a few combats. Specifically, there's a nearby Myrbanon that can reach us as early as turn 1, and a duo composed of a Fire Mage and a Soldier that begin moving to intercept us a few turns later. In an effort to keep feeding Edward as many kills as possible, I had him take out the Myrbanon on turn 1 enemy phase, then pick off the approaching Fire Mage a few turns later. Volug was finally able to flex his muscles a bit here too, following behind Edward to easily one round the soldier, but only after I had Soth nab the Master Seal from their inventory. With those three taken care of, it was finally time to sit back and patiently wait for the rest of the enemies to die. After channeling my inner Ryoma for a bit, we eventually get to a point where there were only four enemies left, all of which are completely stationary and too far away from any of the green units for them to move to attack. At first, I assumed I'd just have to kill them myself, however, I soon realized that I could actually just rescue Zhark and then drop him off in one range of each enemy to get him to kill them on enemy phase, meaning that I could clear the map with only those three initial unavoidable combats. In the end, it did still prove to be pretty tedious, since the green unit AI just loves making them prioritize getting back to their defend point over literally anything else if they stray too far away and because I also had to rescue whoever dropped Zhark off, just to keep them from getting attacked by the two range enemies. This resulted in the quite engaging gameplay loop, where I'd rescue drop Zhark in range of an enemy, he'd get attacked and kill them on enemy phase, and then he'd proceed to immediately start trying to run all the way back to his other green pals, starting the process all over again. But it was well worth the effort to spare our own army the guilt of taking four more and not so innocent lives. Just ignore the fact that all three of the green units, who just finished massacring all those Benyon soldiers, instantly joined our army the second the map ended. We don't talk about those combats. Anyways, having finally met the mysterious lost heir to Dayan's throne, the sorrowful Prince Peleus, Micaiah agrees to join their cause, assimilating the Dawn Brigade into the Dayan Liberation Army. While I'm still not exactly sure how joining an army is supposed to help us avoid more fighting and bloodshed, it does seem like a genuinely good cause, and freeing Dayan from Benyon occupation should signal an end to all the needless fighting, right? Well, at the very least, Micaiah's shown that she seems to only have peaceful, pure intentions so far, so I'm willing to give her the benefit of the doubt. For now. Just as we start preparing to head out on our first mission under a new banner, we're immediately ambushed by Benyon forces and are thrust into battle once again. Although this time, we have the strength of the whole Dayan Liberation Army at our side, the most notable of which being Jill. Now, if you're even remotely familiar with Radiant Dawn, chances are you've heard just how insanely strong and centralizing your Wyvern Knights can be, and Jill is no exception. Despite her amazing potential, she does still have a bit of a rough start though. 
especially when you aren't using transfers. So to catch her up to speed, I immediately pumped her full of Bex levels, promoted her a couple levels early with the Master Seal we'd just stolen, and gave her a strong Iron Axe Forge. With that taken care of, we were finally ready to take on the two maps that collectively make up Chapter 1-6. The first of which is, you guessed it, another route map. My overall approach for this map was focused almost entirely on dealing with the very last group of enemies waiting for us in the northwestern corner of the map, all of which needed to be killed in a single turn to avoid a set of zone-based reinforcements that would otherwise immediately spawn at the start of the next turn. This group consisted of four enemies, a Myrmidon, two bulky Armor Knights with 1-2 range, and a Priest that was completely incapable of attacking us, who was particularly problematic since it meant that, unlike the other three, he couldn't kill himself by attacking into us on enemy phase and then dying on the counter. As I carefully maneuvered my way through the map, having Edward and Jill secure most of the kills, I took special care to have Jill set up a one-use hand axe, and, after routing all but that very last group of enemies, it was finally time to make my move. It was over in an instant. Jill swooped in and one-shot the priest with her one-use hand axe, and then equipped the forged iron axe after it broke. This gave her just enough damage to then one-round both armor knights, and, since she was able to attack from a spot in which the remaining stationary enemies could attack her from one range, she was able to secure kills on all three remaining enemies on enemy phase, ending the map in a total of 18 combats. And just like that, Jill was already off to a fantastic start. To further cement her combat prowess, Jill would also then immediately prove to be invaluable to our strategy for the second part of 1-6. In this map, our only objective is to kill the boss, Levertin, and avoid any extra combats we can along the way. Unfortunately, we're immediately met with four seemingly unavoidable combats right at the start, just due to the nature of our precarious starting position. As such, turn one was pretty much just dedicated to killing them all. After that though, we are rewarded with the sudden appearance of green units, who are going to be absolutely crucial to the rest of this clear. Though, probably not in the way you might expect after seeing how cracked the ones from last chapter were. You see, unlike the absolute combat demons that our last set of greenies were, these ones, well, they aren't exactly known for their combat abilities. I'll just say that. After Levertin releases a bunch of innocent civilians onto the field, so they can effectively act as shields for the Banyan occupying force, Fiona, a cavalier and leader in the local militia, valiantly commands her squad to switch sides and try to carry them to safety. The resulting army of retreating green cavaliers, while pitiful when it comes to combat, were only made more useful by this fact. Unlike the previous chapter, this was a kill boss map, and on easy mode, Levertin is all too happy to go chasing after Fiona and friends. So all I had to do was park Jill under a nearby cliff on turn 2, and then waltz on over to Levertin on turn 3, allowing her to get a clean one round and finish the map in just 5 combats. After seeing Fiona's stellar performance in the last map, and of course recruiting her to join our cause, we're informed that our next mission will involve breaking some Dayan soldiers out of prison. Our totally good and not evil looking strategist Izuka then informs us that his master plan to do so is to simply poison a nearby lake and wait for the Benyon prison guards to die. Makaya, horrified by Izuka's eagerness to perpetrate chemical warfare, an act that she explicitly refers to as inexcusably vile, immediately objects. While poisoning the enemy would in fact cut down on combats, I do agree with Micaiah's brave position here that war crimes are in fact bad. I'm so glad we have such an honorable and considerate commander. Surely Micaiah will stay consistent in her objection to committing to war crimes throughout the rest of the story. But I digress. Let's get to the actual chapter itself. Much like 1-5, 1-7 is another map that features a trio of green units capable of killing pretty much everything on the map that Soth just so happens to be old friends with. Unlike 1-5, however, we can actually have Soth recruit them mid-map, 
And as a result, they have some particularly, shall we say, peculiar AI that's gonna make getting them to kill everything for us much more complicated. You see, the devs really wanted to make sure you'd be able to recruit them. So much so that they won't actually go out of their way to fight nearby enemies, and will instead simply clump around Soth until he talks to them. Obviously, this is going to be a bit of a problem if we want them to handle most of the combat for us. To make matters worse, most of the enemies don't even start moving until you enter their attack range. And it's a seize map, meaning that, on top of everything else, we'd also need to find a way to get Micaiah all the way over to the boss as well. At first, this was all pretty disheartening. The AI seemed to really want them to just crowd around Soth and do nothing else. And ostensibly, the only thing that we could do to actually solve this issue would be to have Soth talk to them. But that would just turn them blue and defeat the whole purpose of getting them to fight things for us in the first place. Like sure, maybe I could get them in range of some enemies, and get those enemies to at least move and maybe die on a counter, but it isn't like any of the three would ever actually move to fight enemies on their own, right? Well, after some rigorous testing, I was able to make a huge discovery. While messing around with unit positioning, I noticed that there actually were some scenarios where our green pals did actually move to attack enemies. After some more testing, I was finally able to determine the underlying cause. While all three green units will, as far as I'm aware, always move to be as close to Soth as possible, if that closest spot just so happens to coincide with the spot that they can attack an enemy from, they will. This was massive. Suddenly, there was hope. With this in mind, I immediately began trying to see just how much combat I could get them to do for us. By carefully positioning Soth each turn as I moved through the map, I was able to get the trio to aggro and attack any enemies that threatened to block our path to the boss. Tormod in particular was absolutely spectacular for this. With his 1-2 range, fairly accurate fire tomes, he was able to consistently one round even the toughest of enemies. It took quite a bit of trial and error, but I was eventually able to cook up a full clear in which none of our units engaged in any combat, even against the boss. In a shocking turn of events, what had at first seemed like a pretty hopeless situation had turned into our first zero combat clear of the entire run. Let's go, Tormod and friends! After that fantastic performance, I'm really looking forward to seeing what they can do once they join us full time. Th they'll be joining us full time, right? Jokes aside, Tormod is going to be really cracked for the short time he's around. Starting with our very next chapter, 1-8. Still riding the high of rescuing all those imprisoned Dayan rebels, Micaiah happily leads the Dawn Brigade on another expedition to save even more Dayan citizens from the clutches of their Banyan occupiers, even though she's well aware that it's very likely a trap. And just like that, we were back to the land of route maps. And it's in a swamp this time! Hooray! It's at this point that I'd like to mention something uniquely interesting about route maps in this run. I vaguely alluded to it back in the first part of 1-6, but on route maps, reinforcements, more specifically, avoiding reinforcements, tends to make clears much more interesting than they'd otherwise be. Back then, we were mostly concerned with a particular set of zone-based reinforcements, but with 1-8, we were dealing with turn-based reinforcements. Most notably, reinforcements that show up on turns 2, 3, and 6. With turn-based reinforcements, we're effectively forced to shift our focus away from only caring about minimizing combats to minimizing turns as well. While one-turning the map to avoid the turn 2 Wyvern Knight reinforcement wasn't really possible, finishing on turn 2 to avoid the turn 3 Brigands seemed much more reasonable. But this was only thanks to the help of our powerful new allies. Our biggest obstacle to getting a two-turn clear was finding a way to reach and one-round everyone in the boss group, including yet another pesky little priest that we'd have to kill on player phase. As such, not only will we need someone to cross the entire swamp by turn two, but they need to do so with enough movement left over to also reach the priest, 
and have access to 1-2 range to be able to counter all the mages. Thankfully, Torgod and friends were perfect for the job. With the combination of celerity and some shoves from both Marim and Vika, Tormod was easily able to reach the priest with plenty of movement to spare. With a forged thunder tome, he was also able to set up one rounds on the entire boss group, though he did need to land at least one of two 20% crits on the boss. In the meantime, I had Edward kill the enemies in the north, Zehark one round the bandit near our starting position, and Volug and Nyla rip apart the enemies to the west. When all was said and done, we'd cleared the map in a grand total of 17 combats, completely avoiding the turn 3 brigand reinforcements, and saving all the captured Dayan citizens. As the Dayan Liberation Army continued to serve up victory after victory, and came ever closer to finally freeing the Dayan people from Benyon oppression, their occupiers, led by Jared, were becoming increasingly desperate. As such, they hatch up and carry out a plan to isolate and assassinate Micaiah, leading us to the absolute slog of a map that is 1-9. While it technically isn't a route map, for all intents and purposes, it is one. Despite the wind condition being to kill the boss, Jared, he only actually spawns after killing every enemy on the map. Hooray! Unfortunately, new enemies show up as reinforcements every single turn all the way through turn 5, so we're also always on a timer to route as quickly as possible. Double hooray! Oh, and it's also a fog of war map. Triple hooray! Oh yeah, and earlier when I mentioned the Benyon occupiers wanting to specifically isolate Micaiah from the rest of the group, I wasn't joking. So we're also missing every other member of the Dawn Brigade except for our good old Micaiah who has not gained a single level or stat since we started the game. It really just keeps getting better. It isn't all bad news though. Our situation is made at least a little bit better by the appearance of the infamous and all-powerful Black Knight. Someone who could easily one-round every single enemy on the map, and who we probably wouldn't be able to progress without. Not so thankfully, the Black Knight has a lot of trouble traversing through all the bushes scattered throughout the map meaning that actually getting him in range of the enemies that he'd so easily kill still made it difficult to finish the map in a timely manner. Ultimately, I was still able to come up with a clear that killed Jared on turn 4, and only took 7 combats in total. So yeah, it definitely could have been worse. Having defeated the crooked tyrant Jared, the Dawn Brigade could finally rest easy- What? You're telling me he's still alive? And that he's holed up in the castle and needs to be fought and killed again? <sighs> well, it would appear we found an enemy that the Black Knight can't actually kill in one round of combat. Looks like we're gonna have to fight Jared all over again. God, that's gonna cost me so many extra combats. You know what, buddy? You're getting benched this chapter. Fuck it. <sighs> okay, just give me a sec. I need to, I need to cool off. Okay, where were we? Where were we? Oh yeah, 1-E. Let's do it. You know, funnily enough, the preps for this chapter tends to be almost as important as the actual map itself. For those unaware, after 1-E, we won't be seeing our buddies in the Dawn Brigade until we're about halfway through part 3. In the meantime, we'll eventually be taking control of the Grail mercenaries and guiding them through a series of pretty difficult maps. And it just so happens, our lovely Thunder Mage, Ileana, actually joins them pretty early into their journey, bringing along all the items and skills she had at the end of Part 1. This means that with the proper planning, we can help give the Grail Mercs a much needed head start, and maybe save on some combats down the line. As such, I spent quite some time pondering exactly what skills and items would be best to send over eventually deciding to have her bring the skills Celerity, Paragon, and Savior, as well as some items that I could sell to help pad the Grail Merc's lacking funds. Now, on to the actual chapter itself. The map is most notable for the many ledges and sets of stairs we need to ascend in order to actually reach Jared, so the first few turns were mostly spent just getting our units as far forward as possible, and of course, killing some pesky enemies we were forced to fight along the way. 
I started by having the highly mobile wolves Nyla and Volug rescue Makaya and Raphael, respectively, and ferry them along as Jill handled pretty much all the combat. Before entering the room with the boss, I took some extra time to set things up so that, on the next turn, I could handle all the enemies in the boss room, grab an optional item from a chest, kill the boss, and seize, all in one turn. By dropping off Makaya and Raphael into very specific spots, I was able to set up a four-way dance on the following turn that would allow Jill to kill both the boss and an armor knight initially blocking the way, Nyla to nab the parody scroll from one of the northwestern chests, and finally, Makaya to reach the seize point after a shove from Volug. And with that, we cleared 1-E in 9 combats, and finally got rid of Jared for good. Finally, Dayan was completely free from Banyan oppression, and the Dawn Brigade could finally retire from all the fighting. While the liberation of Dayan did require a lot of bloodshed and needless death, I'm glad we had the ostensibly righteous and peace-loving Micaiah at the reins the whole time. With her taking the role of general in the newly freed Dayan state, I'm very optimistic that she'll be able to steer Dayan away from all the needless violence and bloodshed that had been plaguing the nation since the Mad King's War. So before we officially wrap things up for the first episode of the Minimum Combats run, let's take a quick look back at everything that just went down combat-wise in Part 1. Obviously we've been keeping track of the total number of combats accrued over the course of each chapter, but I also thought it'd be neat to zoom out for a second and look at things from a more broad perspective, and, you know, look at how we did, see if we can identify any trends, that sort of stuff. This will be especially nice due to how massive of a game Radiant Dawn is, and because it gives me the perfect excuse to complain about all the stupid fucking route maps there are in this game. Because, spoiler alert, a lot of our combats are going to come from the unavoidable ones imposed by route objectives. Looking at you, part four. But anyways, I digress. We'll cross that bridge when we get there. For now, let's just focus on our efforts in part one. So, throughout the entirety of the Dawn Brigade's first arc, we engaged in a total of 91 combats. Of those 91 combats, 63 of them, or roughly 69%, nice, came from route maps, with the other 28, or 31%, coming from non-route maps. Looking at the overall distribution of these combats throughout the different chapters, there are really only two or three with a significantly greater number of combats, despite half of them being strictly route maps. At first, this may seem a bit surprising, but if you look at the individual chapters themselves, it all starts to make sense. For one prologue, it's the very first chapter in the game, so despite it being a route map, there are still only four enemies in total that we have to fight. Similarly, 1-4 comes pretty early, and is composed solely of powerful Laguz enemies, so it makes sense that there are relatively few to fight. And finally, for 1-5, we're graced with the presence of some powerful green units, that we were able to get to do most of the combat for us. In a similar vein, the chapters that took us the fewest number of combats tended to be the ones where there were non-blue units present, or ones that just had a really favorable win condition and map layout. For example, 1-1 is a kill boss map that only has a couple enemies standing between us and the boss. 1-3 gives us unarmed yellow units that we could safely send out to draw the enemy's attention. The second map in 1-6 was another kill boss, except this time we could also bait them out with some weak green units. And finally, there's 1-7, our first, but hopefully not the last, zero combat clear, which was of course carried by a trio of powerful green units with some amazing combat. Well, that'll be it for part one. Up next, we'll be looking at part two where the peace-loving queen of Crimea herself, Alincia, tries to quell a rebellion and potential civil war, while also trying to avoid fighting her own countrymen at all costs. We'll have to see how she stacks up to Micaiah. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss out. I hope to see you there. Peace.